We are here once again on the eastern banks of the Fox River, this time in downtown Aurora. Aurora was incorporated in 1845 and is now the second largest city in all of Illinois. It's so large that it takes four Illinois counties to hold it. Aurora was one of the first cities in the U.S. to incorporate electricity for its street lighting, and hence its nickname, the City of Lights. We're standing here at River Edge Park and behind us is construction of a new pedestrian cycling bridge that's been underway for a bit and will link the two cycling and pedestrian footpaths on both sides of the Fox River. It's scheduled for completion in 2023. She's Joyce. And he's Brian. And we're here to continue our virtual tour of the disused stations of the Chicago, Aurora, and Elgin Railway, this time focusing on the Aurora branch. Aurora was the southernmost branch of the railway, and from 1915 onwards, it was also the railway headquarters. The Aurora branch was built concurrent with the mainline branch and was the first branch west of Wheaton to be put into service, opening in 1902. There were 18 stops and stations on the Aurora line, including the terminals at Wheaton and Aurora, and the line was approximately 14 and a half miles long. Only 0.6 miles, or 4% of the total 4.5 mile railway, is inaccessible today, which means that we'll be able to see most of the trackways right of way, even today. This branch originally also had about six to seven sidings, depending on how you count them. Six bridges, three underpasses, and three electrical power substations. With a few exceptions, the Aurora branch of the Chicago Aurora and Elgin Railway was a single trackway and we'll point out those double trackway exceptions uh, as we go. The history of the Aurora Terminal is complicated as it moved about several times during its lifetime. So we're going to focus on two of its longest standing locations from when it was established as a terminal in 1902 till the railway was shut down in 1957. Prior to 1915, the A, E, and C Terminal had multiple homes, starting at the intersection of Spring Street and Broadway, then East Downer Place and Broadway, all with storefront terminals and street boarding. But in all cases, Broadway Street was the key. From 1915 until 1935, the Chicago Aurora and Elgin Terminal was relocated to 2 North Broadway at the northwest corner of Broadway and Galena Boulevard in what had previously been known as Hotel Arthur. This building was built in 1905 and at that time was the tallest building in Aurora at six stories high. The Aurora, Elgin, and Chicago Railway occupied multiple floors of this new building after they moved their general offices from their Wheaton headquarters due to a fire in 1913, which had destroyed that building. The Aurora, Elgin, and Chicago Railway shared this new building with a few other prominent local lines, and so this building became known as the Traction Terminal Building. Here, the Aurora Terminal was set up as a storefront with ticket sales and street boarding and connections to the other electric rail lines that proceeded south and west across the Fox River. This early skyscraper still stands at the northwest corner of Broadway and Galena today. Due to street congestion, the city of Aurora was keen to move the Chicago Aurora and Elgin off of Broadway Street boarding. And so from 1939 onwards, the Chicago Aurora and Elgin moved off the streets to a new terminal, just one block north, set along the east banks of the Fox River and near the northeast intersection of New York Street and the Fox River. So the new terminal was located at 56 North Broadway, just one block north of where the Traction Terminal building was located. And that building was right across the street where that sidewalk is entering the parking lot. The building's gone now, of course, but at that time it was a storefront terminal where you could go in and buy tickets, go through the terminal to the back, and then you could access the platform by going through the back of the terminal. And the other way you could access the platform is via the Fox River Bridge, which we'll show you in just a moment. This is the other way that you'd access the Aurora Terminal from the Fox River Bridge from New York Street. You'd come down the stairs, the wooden stairs or catwalk, which ran alongside of this building here, which is the same building that existed back when the terminal was here across the catwalk and the terminal was located right about there where the sidewalk is 
and that was a raised platform. The platform canopy that was built in 1939 featured a curved roof with latticework between the columns, and it stood until 1991 when it was finally torn down. The next stop is at Illinois Avenue, which is about a mile north of where we're located. So that's where we're going next. station and this was a double trackway at this point with overhead trolley wiring. Being a double trackway it had waiting stations on both sides of the trackway for northbound traffic and southbound traffic. Northbound going in into Chicago, southbound heading into downtown New York. The waiting station for the northbound or Chicago bound traffic was located at the southeast corner of the intersection of the trackway with Illinois Avenue and consisted of a small frame building with a hip roof and a long cinder platform. The waiting station for the southbound or Aurora bound traffic was located kitty corner to the northbound station on the northwest corner of the intersection, about where those machines are presently operating and may have simply consisted of a long cinder platform. This station originated in the late 1920s and was closed down in 1957 with the closure of the railway. The next stop is Aurora Avenue, which is about a half mile north of here. And I would also point out that the, the trackway is somewhat deprecated at this point. Um, we'll point that out as we're riding by it, but the trackway has been modified and the new path is rerouted a little bit to the west and north of the original trackway. We'll see it at Aurora Avenue.
We're here at the Aurora Avenue station and you can see where the old trackway came through. It's now been deprecated as, and is private property. But if you, again, if you just follow the line of the telephone poles, the electrical poles, that gives you a very strong clue as to where the railway track went. Now this was a double trackway here, just like at Illinois Avenue, with overhead trolley wiring. And as a double trackway, it had two waiting stations. The trackway leading to the north and the east, the waiting station was located on the other side of the, to the west of the Chicago, Burlington and Quincy railroad tracks, about where that telephone pole and that planting is located. So that was the waiting station for the north and eastbound traffic, passenger traffic. Now for the southbound traffic heading into Aurora, about where our bikes are located, and on the other side of the Chicago Burlington and Quincy Railroad tracks was the waiting station for the southbound traffic. Now again, this was a full stop, and it was right about this point, or a little bit beyond this point, at which we went from a double trackway to a single trackway, and where we go from overhead trolley wiring to being powered by the third rail. And as you can see across the street, the trackway continues with the electrical poles, telephone poles, heading off in that direction. And again, that portion of the, the trackway has been deprecated because again, that's private property going through that parking lot. But once we get beyond that point, we're going to be hitting the original trackway again. And a little bit beyond there, we're going to see the Hanks Avenue substation, power substation, where power was sent from the powerhouse in Batavia to this Aurora power substation to be converted from AC to DC. See you there. Okay, so we've arrived at the Hanks Avenue power substation, which is right off of Hanks Avenue, conveniently. And uh, so in this empty space that we see today right along the trackway was the Aurora power substation, also called the Hanks Avenue substation. This is where power was sent from the Batavia powerhouse, and uh, it was just further distributed from this power station. Uh, up the line and you can still see that there is an artifact remaining I'm not exactly sure what this is perhaps some of our viewers can inform us so this was one of three power stations that uh, existed along this uh, line this is the first the next one we'll see is at Beale Road um, and then the third one was at Montview
So we've ridden the one mile to the Church Road Station, and the Church Road Station was located right here on Church Road, which is right behind us. And there was a classic scene here at Church Road. And the station is located on the northwest corner of the intersection of the trackway and the Church Road. And what's very exciting about this station is, as you can see, that all the remaining concrete curbing of the platform, of the cinder platform, still exists. It all runs from that tree all the way down here, further down. Further down. And it runs all the way down to that tree down there. So it's about 100 feet in all. And right here in this opening would have been the station, the waiting station, which would have been a frame building about eight by eight with a hip roof. And even more exciting is the, all of the original cinders, this is the original cinder platform. Those cinders came from the Batavia powerhouse, from the, uh, the, the residue left from their firings, their coal firings from that power plant. So they're all still here. This cinder platform is largely intact from more than 60 years ago. So that's a big tick on our virtual tour of the stations of the Chicago Warren Elgin Railway. This was a flag stop. And uh, as we mentioned at the, the previous power station coming up here, this set now was a single trackway. It was powered by the third rail at this point. Church Road and the Church Road Station may have been named in reference to the Annunciation of the Blessed Virgin Mary Catholic Church, established in 1875, and which sits adjacent to Church Road near Molotow Road in North Aurora. The next station is at Poss Road, which is quite a distance from here, over two miles uh, north and east of here. We'll see you there.
Okay, we've ridden the 2.2 miles from Church Road Station to here we are at Poss Road Station, which is located likely at the southwest corner of the intersection of what is today Molitor Road, which was then Poss Road. Molitor Road with the uh, track road. This station was opened in 1902, but was abandoned by 1920. And it was a flag stop. Uh, it was a rural stop. And it, uh, being a rural stop, it was most likely used for local farmers to load and unload their milk containers for the, the market in Chicago. This uh, station stop was named for, likely for Henry Poss, who was a local farmer and whose land intersected uh, with the trackways, so he likely got naming rights. And so the next stop to the northeast, about a half mile, is Batavia Junction. So we will see you there. Okay, so we've ridden a half mile from the Poss Road Station to Batavia Junction. We've been here before uh, amongst this forest of uh, power towers. This station was established in 1902 as Eola Junction, then renamed in the 1912 time frame to Batavia Junction. The station was later rebuilt in the late 1920s. Service to the junction was reduced in 1953 and the station was finally closed in 1957 with the closure of the railway. Batavia Junction was located about 300 feet west of Eola Road and was situated just south of the present-day prairie path, about where the fencing and ramp begins for the pedestrian bridge. This was a full stop, as the station served customers coming from both the Batavia Line and the Aurora Line. The station sat between the two converging lines providing walkways and platforms for both lines. The station was rebuilt in the late 1920s with a high-level platform, enabling the customers to move rapidly from one line to the other without going up and down the stairs. The waiting station itself was a modest frame building, about 10 by 10, with a hip roof that sat between and connected both platforms. The Batavia platform was covered and was approximately one train car length. The Aurora platform was partially covered and was three train car lengths in size. The original name of the station, Eola Junction, was named for Eola Road, which was just to the east of the station, and which in turn was named for the community of Eola, which was about a mile due south of the station. The origin of the Eola name is obscure. However, there's an apocryphal story that the name Eola is said to stand for end of the line Aurora, which is what the conductor of the cb &Q Railroad would call out when they arrived at cb &Q's Eola Station. Going forward along the trackway, there was a double trackway from Batavia Junction to the Deal Road Station, which is the next stop to the east. So we'll see you there.
So we've ridden a little over a mile from Batavia Junction to the Deal Road Station, um, which is just about where we're standing in this uh, general locale. We're just north of Deal Road right now. The Deal Road Station was on a double trackway. It was a flag stop. Uh, it was on third rail power, of course, along here. And uh, being on a double trackway, it had two waiting stations, one for the westbound traffic and one for the eastbound traffic. The eastbound traffic platform was located actually probably just in Deal Road itself. Uh, the westbound lanes of Deal Road, right about there. So uh, Deal Road has been significantly expanded, of course, since uh, back in the day. And uh, so the eastbound station, which was the larger platform, was likely located in the uh, the rightmost lane of uh, Deal Road right there. The westbound station was located just along in here. So it was a little further to the northwest and probably consisted of a, a low-level cinder platform, whereas the eastbound platform would have been a 8x8 uh, wooden structure with a a slant roof on top, a sloped slanted roof on top. So the Deal Road stop and road appears to have been named for local farmers George and Mary Gardner Deal, whose farm and house were hard by the Deal Road station here. Although uh, George's parents, Adam and Francis Hildebrand Deal, were also prominent pioneers in the Naperville area as well. So it's possible it was named for them. The deals, by the way, are all buried in St. Peter and Paul Cemetery in Naperville, Illinois. The uh, next stop is Ferry Road, which is a little over a mile uh, north and east of here. So we'll see you there. Just walking along this uh, side path so we can get a better view of where the ferry road station is located. So we're here nearby the ferry road station. The ferry road station was a flag stop established in 1902, closed down in 1957 when the railway closed down. And, and it would have been located right about there uh, in the southwest corner of the intersection of what is today Ferry Road, what was then Ferry Road, with the trackway. The trackway used to be at grade, uh, but now they've uh, built this pedestrian cycling bridge, this very nice cycling bridge, over the Ferry Road, which is now a very busy road. And as a result, they've all but obliterated uh, what would have been the location of the station which again would have been here along the southwest corner. Now Ferry Road and the station stop appear to be named for either George Warren and Mabel Boyd Ferry, who are buried in the Big Wood Cemetery in Lola, Illinois, or possibly Joseph Sanford and Sophronia Kenyon Ferry, who are buried in Spring Lakes and Cemetery in Aurora. Both of their farms were located close by the station. So the next stop is Williams Road, which is just about a mile 
north and east of here. So we'll see you there. arrived close to the Williams Road Station uh, along the Aurora branch of the Chicago Aurora and Elgin trackway. And uh, the Williams Road Station would have been a flag stop on, uh, powered by the third rail. And it would have been located about 45 steps from what is Big Woods Road right here, aka Williams Road, just uh, along in here. So this is the southwest corner of the intersection of uh, Williams Road with the trackway and it would have put it just along in here and it would have been a probably a long cinder platform with a a wooden frame structure for the waiting room, perhaps uh, six by six or eight by eight with a hip roof, I believe. So this station was established in 1902 and closed down in 1957 when the railway closed down. Williams Road and Williams Road Station appear to be a reference to local farmers Henry Sterling and Sarah Jane Welty Williams. They owned over 400 acres just west of Warrenville. The Williams family are buried in the Warrenville Cemetery, less than a mile east and southeast of the station. So the next stop will be the Warrenville Station. Uh, and along the way, we should see a signal base artifact up along the left on the north side of the uh, trackway. So we'll try to point that out as we go. We'll see you at Warrenville. station was established in 1902 and closed with the railway in 1957. 
This was a substantial brick building, located about 230 feet, or about 100 steps, from the southwest corner of the intersection of Batavia and Butterfield Roads, along the Illinois Prairie Path, at what would be today 28 West 630 Stafford Place in Warrenville, Illinois. This was a full stop with a ticket office and was similar in design to the Clintonville station that we've already seen, and so was about 40 feet by 60 feet in size. Once the Chicago Aurora and Elgin shut down in 1957, the building was converted to a store, then to a coffee shop, and then to the Warrenville City Hall in the late 1960s. The station building was finally torn down in 2003, when a more modern and larger replacement for the City Hall was built a short distance to the southwest. Today, the station site has been transformed into open green space, fronting Stafford Place stores and the Warrenville administrative buildings. Warrenville and the station were named for Julius Warren, an early pioneer and settler in the area from the first part of the 19th century. He died in 1893 and is buried in the Warrenville Cemetery, which is about a third of a mile south of here. The city of Warrenville incorporated in 1967. There was a crossing signal in Batavia Road to the east of the station. There was also a siding just west of the station and along the south side of the tracks. at the Montview station just off of Winfield Road and uh, this was a flag stop on a single trackway and it would have been located just across Winfield Road on the southeast corner of where the trackway meets Winfield Road and notice that the trackway no longer goes through on that side of the road so we see the the uh, telephone poles, the electrical poles, going off in that direction, diagonal direction, that was the path of the original trackway. And so the station would have been located somewhere about right over there and just off the road. Winfield Road has been widened significantly uh, since, since the, uh, the trackway's been here. So it would have been just off the road, perhaps on the sidewalk, uh, where the sidewalk's located today. The station was originally called East Warrenville Station. It's later right changed to Montview. Uh, it's not entirely clear to me what where the Montview name came from, however. Also, this station featured a siding just to the uh, south and west. And also, it featured a electrical substation, which would have been located about where these plantings are right now. And notice how the utility company, Commonwealth Edison, today has continued with that pattern and, and they have an electrical substation located uh, almost in the same spot. We've seen this pattern before on other branches where the utility co-ops the previous function and uh, continues to use it as an electrical substation. So the next station is north and east of here. It's called Gary Road. It was a short-lived station and we'll learn more about that when we get here. 
but this part of the road will be deprecated and we'll have to make a small detour uh, and go off the trackway for a little bit. So we'll see you there. Just right here was the uh, Hoy Road, so the, the railway uh, went under the road, there was a bridge over the railway right here. So we've gotten close to the Gary Road Station, which is today in St. James Farm, which is part of the DuPage County Forest Preserve District. The best guess for where the station was located is somewhere in this corner, um, perhaps a couple hundred feet from the property edge, the south, the uh, east corner of the property, which is currently somewhat undeveloped, uh, is Prairie within St. James Farm. This station was established in 1902 on what was originally farmland. It was closed sometime prior to 1920, likely when the land on which it stood was sold to a wealthy family who had other plans for the property. In the early 1900s, this property belonged to John Ballweg, who then sold it around 1920 to the McCormick family of mechanical reaper fame. The McCormick family turned the property into a grand equestrian farm with well-maintained grounds. Later, the McCormick family sold the property to the DuPage County Forest Preserve with the stipulation that the land would be turned over at the death of Brooks McCormick. Brooks subsequently died in 2006. Brooks McCormick was a cousin of Robert McCormick of Cantini and Chicago Tribune Renown. You can still follow the line of the original Chicago, Aurora, and Elgin trackway through St. James Farm property by following the utility poles from the east portion of the property heading off to the southwest. During its short life, the stop likely consisted of a wooden platform, possibly with a small wooden shelter, and was likely located on the south side of the trackway, the same side of the trackway on which other stations on the Aurora Line were situated. This station also featured a small eight-car siding directly north of the trackway. The name Gary Road may have referenced local farmers Edwin Augustus and Lina Isabel Gary who owned property along the south side of Butterfield Road, and who actually owned the property on which the Mount View stop was located. Alternatively, Gary Road could reference Edwin's parents, Jude Perrin and Lydia Sherwood Gary, who owned property on both sides of Butterfield Road in 1874. The Garys were among the founding families of Wheaton, and most of these early pioneers are today buried in Wheaton Cemetery, a few miles to the east. So the next station is Weisbrook Road, and uh, that's just a little less than a mile north and east of here, so we'll see you there. Thank you. 
we've reached the Weisbrook Road station, which was a flag stop uh, on a single trackway, and it would have been located at the southeast corner of the intersection of Weisbrook Road and the trackway. Uh, the actual specific location of the station would have been about 30 steps, 30 steps from uh, Weisbrook Road along the prairie path, which would have put it right about in this location here, just in advance of these rocks. And it was a, a modest wooden structure, perhaps 8 by 8 in size, um, and it would have had a cinder platform along here, perhaps 50 feet long or so. There was a signal crossing at Weisbrook Road right here, and there was also a small siding to the north and east of the uh, station called McCormick Siding, just up along here. Weesbrook Road appears to have been named for a local farmer, John Weesbrook, whose property was astride the trackway near the station. So the next station is Plamondon Road, which is a little over a mile north and east of here, so we'll see you there. This station was established in 1902 and was closed in 1957 with the closure of the railway. This station was a flag stop on a single trackway. The station was located on the southeast side of the trackway, about 100 feet due west of Plamondon Road and about 750 feet or 230 meters from Orchard Road to the southwest. The station consisted of a small wooden shelter, perhaps 6 to 8 feet square, with a hip roof and a long wooden platform with railings. This station was named for Plamondon Road, which in turn was named for George Plamondon, a prominent Chicago businessman and industrialist. George built a large Victorian summer house in rural southwest Wheaton and called it Green Gables. He built this house in order to be close to his dearly loved Chicago Golf Club, which is a short distance north of here. His house, Green Gables, was built just a few hundred feet north-northwest of the Plamondon station. Along with this new residence, Plamondon also established a subdivision in 1909 adjoining his new property, subdividing his 200-acre estate into lots 5 to 15 acres in size, and where only the most expensive residences will be allowed. George Plamondon died in 1917. His estate was sold and by 1924 was turned into the Wheaton Gables subdivision. The Green Gables house and portions of Plamondon subdivision still exist to this day. The station and the trackway along it illustrate an important aspect of the ca and &E Railway in how it could forever alter the topography of the roads and property lines in the area along the right-of-way. Before the railway was built, Warrenville Road went directly southwest out of Wheaton, unhindered towards Warrenville on its path. Once the railway came, 
due to the oblique angle in which the road crossed the railway, and possibly due to the grade difference, they diverted Warrenville Road southward to meet Orchard Road, and the rail crossing then became a right angle across Orchard Road, which was likely good for safety, but forever creating an ungainly sharp set of turns in the road, and bifurcating Warrenville Road into what was to become Plamondon Road to the north and Weesbrook Road to the south. The remaining stub of Warrenville Road to the southwest of the trackway was to conveniently culminate at Plamondon's Circular Drive in front of his Green Gables house. So the next stop up the trackway here is the Chicago Golf Ground Stop Station. That's a little less than half a mile from here. But let's, uh, let's walk up the road, Joyce, to where we found that uh, signal base. So this might have been the signal crossing base. Right there. So another artifact along the trackway. We'll see you at the Chicago Golf Grounds. We've now arrived at the site of the Chicago Golf Station along the Aurora branch of the Chicago, Aurora, and Elgin Railway. The station was established in 1902, then rebuilt in 1910 and closed in 1957 with the closure of the railway. The Chicago Golf Station was located about 250 feet northeast of where Gables Boulevard intersects with the Illinois Prairie Path. This was a flagstop station, but housed in an elegant and substantial brick building on the east side of the trackway, primarily serving patrons of the Chicago Golf Club, which was located a short distance to the south and east of the station. The Chicago Golf Club is one of the oldest and most venerable golf clubs in the United States. Established in 1895, it may have been the first 18-hole course in the U.S. It went on to host the National Amateur Championships in 1897 1905, 1909, and 1912. It also hosted the National Open Tournaments in 1897, 1900, and 1911. The station building was torn down within a few years of the railway's closure. The trackway was doubled from just west of this station to the Wheaton Station, and so there was also a modest platform on the west side of the tracks for southbound traffic. There was also a seven-car siding just west and south of the station. The siding and the doubled tracks were apparently designed so as to have train cars waiting to whisk patrons of the Chicago Golf Country Club back to Wheaton and then onwards to Chicago towards evening. They also served as transportation for the many weekend and evening social events held at the Country Club. There are a few artifacts remaining. Uh, one of them is located at a signal base. right over in here and using the signal base we we know where the station was located because from old photographs we can tell pretty close to how far that was away and then the other artifact is just down here it's a bit of it's a bit obscure what this is actually, and if this was the original position of this concrete base, but it seems to be at a strange angle to the trackway. Um, 
it's possible that this was dumped in this location and it was originally somewhere else, not cl entirely clear, but um, almost certainly this had something to do with the original trackway. Okay, the next station is Emory. So we've reached the Emory Station, which was located on the northeast corner of the intersection of Arbor Street and the trackway. So that would be the northeast corner over there. This station was established in the 1905 to 1920 time frame and was closed around 1944, likely due to its close proximity to the Emory at Chicago Station, which is located just a short distance to the north. This was a flag stop on a double trackway. The primary eastbound station was located on the northeast corner of the intersection of Arbor Avenue and the trackway. Since it was a double trackway, there was also a small platform for westbound traffic on the west side of the track. By the 1920s, the eastbound station featured a frame waiting station with a hip roof and a cinder platform. This stop was named for the Emory Hill subdivision, an early 1900s development just to the west of the railway designed by landscape architect Walter Burley Griffin, a native of Maywood, Illinois. The subdivision was originally a 20-acre plot that was subdivided into nine high-priced farmettes arranged around a circular loop road. Although a few houses were eventually put in as part of the subdivision, the overall plan was never realized. So we've come the one block from Emory, and we're now at Emory at Chicago, aka Chicago Avenue. The station was established in 1902 and was closed in 1957 with the closure of the CA&E Railway. The Emory at Chicago station was located south of present-day Roosevelt Road, which was then referred to as Chicago Avenue, with the eastbound station approximately 250 feet, or 100 steps, due south of Roosevelt Road and located on the east side of the trackway. This station was a small station with two low-level platforms on either side of the trackway and a wooden frame shelter about 8x8 with broad overhanging eaves. This was a flag stop and was the final stop before arriving at the Wheaton station, or the first stop heading southwest out of Wheaton.
So we've reached the uh, Wheaton Station, and the Wheaton Station today is a parking lot. At one point it was a large brick structure about 100 feet by 30 feet, but we'll talk much more about that in uh, when we cover the main line branch. But as for today, we've uh, completed our journey from Aurora to uh, Wheaton, and now I'll go sit with Joyce and we'll talk about our trip. So Joyce, we finished our Aurora trip. What would be your highlights for this trip? Uh, probably the place I like the best is the park in Warrenville. Yeah, it's a nice park. They've uh, done a nice job transforming that whole area. Yeah. So yeah, it's a, a place we often eat lunch on our trips. I guess my favorite spots or highlights were uh, I think the church road stop that still had the cinder uh, platform intact. I think that was uh, pretty special seeing that. I think the, um, the various artifacts that we saw along the way, the flag stop, uh, or signal bases I should say, um, I think that was uh, pretty interesting. You, it's easy to pass right by them without noticing them. And then the third thing would be uh, the Plamondon Road stop, only because just the, the, the history of that stop and um, what was, uh, how it changed the, the landscape and the topography and the, uh, the uh, property lines and so on all along there, I think uh, is interesting. And even today we're left with the legacy of that sort of messed up intersection. Uh, Orchard and uh, Weesbrook Road and Warrenville Road. So those are my uh, the highlights for me, I guess. So uh, that ends today's virtual tour. Uh, please stay tuned for our next uh, virtual tour. I think the only remaining one we have to do is the main line, and that should be a, a bit of an adventure as well. Um, We've covered most of the stations, but we still have about 20 or so to go uh, of the 70 plus stations and stops and facilities, power stations of the uh, Chicago Aurora and Elgin. For Joyce and I, I think we've had a long day <laughs> and are tired. And um, if you're so inclined and uh, this is entertaining to you, please like and subscribe. And we'll see you at our next segment.